Hello, this is Dr. Joe Trout from the physics program at Stockton University. This lecture will be on projectile motion. So whether you're firing something from a cannon at its angle, or you're tossing a baseball in the backyard, this is known as projectile motion. So let's consider taking a baseball and tossing it from the ground and having it land some distance away. And what it will do is take a picture every half a second. So every half a second, we'll take a picture of the baseball and we'll go ahead and graph the Y position versus the X position for all of these pictures. So we'll end up is something that looks like this. So don't forget, the X axis is the x direction and the x position and the y axis is the height it's the y position and you'll notice something here if you look closely the distance it travels in the x direction every half a second is constant so every half a second it moves about 20 meters maybe 21 meters so every half a second it moves about 21 meters in the X direction. So if we were to shine a light or consider the sun directly over the head of where you're playing baseball, what you'd see is the shadow move across the yard about 21 meters every half a second. Okay, so the velocity in the X direction is constant. That means the acceleration is zero and if we look for the x-velocity, it's equal to the initial x-velocity, and the initial x-velocity is just the initial velocity times the cosine of theta. So in the x-direction, there's no acceleration, velocity is constant, and we can predict the position. On the other hand, in the y-direction, what happens is the first half a second, it moves about 10 meters up. The second half a second, it moves less than 10 meters. The third half a second, it moves about five meters and then about two meters. And then it stops going up and it starts coming down. So what's happening is it's moving really fast up and up and, and then it starts slowing, right? So then it's less, it's going, um, its velocity is decreasing as it goes up. Eventually, the velocity becomes zero at the top and it starts coming down to Earth faster and faster and faster and faster. Okay, so the velocity in the Y direction is not, is not constant. But what we find when we do the experiment is the velocity, the acceleration in the y direction is equal to minus 9.8 meters per second squared, okay, which is minus g. And what we have is that our velocity is linear. So it's equal to, since the acceleration is constant, it's equal to the initial y velocity minus gt, where minus g is the acceleration. And we can predict the position. So these look like the equations from free, free fall, right? So y equals y naught plus the initial y velocity times t minus one half gt squared. And finally, we have this equation which gives us the magnitude of the y velocity as a function of y displacement, right, or change in y. Okay, so here's the equations we're going to use. So our initial x velocity is v naught cosine of theta, and our initial y velocity is v naught sine of theta. Don't forget, these are going to be in degrees, so make sure your calculator is in degrees, at least for this part of the assignment, right, for this part of the class for projectile motion. Okay, so let's look at an example. Here what we're going to do is we're going to launch a ball from the ground at 20 meters per second at an angle of 40 degrees and 
we're going to let it fly through the air and land some distance away. So it's going to go and reach a maximum height and then start coming down towards Earth. If it starts and stops at the same height, like this diagram shows, then this maximum x distance is called the range. Okay? And really, you could just call it x max, right? But if somebody says the range, what they mean is that it started and it stopped at the same height, and it's the maximum distance it went in the x direction. We also have the maximum height, so y max. And we can find that because the velocity, the y velocity at the very top is equal to zero. The x velocity is constant, but the y velocity at the top is zero. We also like to find something called the time of flight. So that's how long it's been in the air. Okay, And also our final velocity and our final angle. Sometimes you're asked to find that. Okay, so when you have these problems, the very first thing to do is if you're given the initial velocity and the initial angle, go ahead and find the x and y components. Notice that the angle here is 40 degrees, which tells me that the x and y angle, I mean the x and y components are going to be comparable, right? They'd be exactly the same magnitude if this was 45 degrees, right? Okay, and in this case, the x velocity is going to be a little larger. So we get 20 meters times the cosine of 40 equals 15 meters per second. And 20 meters times the sine of 40 is almost 13 meters per second. Okay, so what do we want to find first? Let's go find ahead and find y max first. We know that the acceleration in the y direction is minus zero. We know what the initial velocity is. And we also know the final velocity at the top for the y component. The final velocity there will be zero meters per second. So no matter where we are, the x velocity is 15 meters per second. And our initial velo y velocity is about 13 meters per second, but it gets less and less and less. It goes to zero and then gets larger and larger negative. Okay, so we can use that to find the maximum height. So we know that our final y velocity equals our initial y velocity squared minus 2g delta y and we can solve for delta y. Okay, so delta y, we'll bring it over, you bring delta 2g delta y over to the other side of the equation, and then subtract our y velocity, and then divide by 2g. So we get 12.86 meters per second squared minus zero, divided by two, times 9.8 meters per second squared. Don't forget, g is 9.8 meters per second squared. The acceleration in the y direction is minus g. Okay, so whatever you see a g, plug in 9.8, not minus 9.8. Okay, we've already taken care of the minus sign here. And we end up with a maximum height or displacement in the y direction and we're going to assume our initial y velocity is zero. Okay, so it goes up 8.4 meters. Next let's find the time of flight. What can we do for the time of flight? Well, one thing we know is that the acceleration is still minus g. We also know that the initial y position and the final y position are equal. And we know the initial y velocity. And we're looking for time. Okay, so here's an equation that has time in it, but it won't work. 
because we don't know our final x position. Here's one that has time in it, but we don't know our final y velocity. Here's an equation with time in it, and let's see. We know that our final position is zero and our initial position is zero, or at least they're the same. We know our initial y velocity, and we're looking for t. So it looks like this equation will work. So we get y equals y naught plus the initial y velocity t minus one half g t squared. The initial y and the final y are the same, so they cancel. Or in this case, they actually happen to be zero. We'll bring the minus one half g t over the other side. One of the t's will cancel out. And we end up with the time is equal to two times the initial velocity in the y direction divided by 9.8. And we end up with about 2.62 seconds. So our time of flight is 2.62 seconds. Can you estimate the range now? So can you give me an estimate of what the range might be? Well, in the x direction, we're traveling a constant about 15 meters per second. Do you agree? So in the x direction, we keep moving 15.32 meters each second. So let's call it around 15. And we're going to do that for almost three seconds. So 15 times three is about 45, right? So I think if I did a really quick calculation, I'd say, oh, it's gonna land about 45 feet meters away. Let's check. So what do we know? We know that the velocity is constant in the x direction, and we know what the time of flight is. So we have this equation for the x direction, for the x component. So we get x will equal the initial y velocity times the time of flight, and it comes out to be about 40.14 meters. So we know how high it went, and we know how far away it landed, and we know how long it was in the air. The final thing we want to know is what this final velocity is and what this final angle is. Any guesses what they might be? Well, maybe if you had a little physics before, you may know that the magnitude will be 20 meters per second and the angle will be negative 40 degrees. And this has something to do with something we call energy and the conservation of energy. And we'll talk about that in a couple of chapters. But until that time, let's go ahead and figure out what it is. So if we go for the final velocity, what we have is that our final x velocity is equal to our initial x velocity because it's constant. It doesn't change. If we look for our final y velocity, it's equal to the minus, I'm sorry, it's equal to the initial y velocity minus 9.8 times how long it'd be in the air. So we end up with negative 12.86 meters per second. And if you remember our ij notation, we can write the final velocity as 15.32 meters per second in the x direction or the i direction and minus 12.86 meters per second in the y direction or we called it the, the j direction, right? And i and j are just unit vectors. This points in the x direction, j points in the y direction. Now we can use Pythagorean's theorem to find out the magnitude, and we can use inverse tangent to find out the angle. So for the magnitude, we get the x velocity squared plus the y velocity squared. That's 15.32 meters per second. And then I'm sorry, this should be minus 12.86, but we're gonna square it so it'll come out positive anyway. <laughs> 
And if we put in the values, we get 20 meters per second. And if we take the inverse tangent of minus 12.86 divided by 15.32 and the units cancel, I get minus 40. Okay, so we know how high it went. We know how far in the x direction it went. We know how long it was in the air. And we know the final velocity and the final angle of the, of the velocity. Okay, so any questions about that? Okay, so here's a little problem. Oh, sorry. We can go ahead and graph this. So if we look at the x velocity, it's constant. So the x velocity stays constant up to about 2.6 seconds when it hits the ground. Our x position is linear and the slope of this graph is 15.32 meters per second. And if you remember, it landed a little over 40 meters. We didn't plot the x acceleration because there isn't any, right? It would just be zero. If we look for the y acceleration, it's minus 9.8 and it's constant. So we get a straight line with a zero slope because it's not changing, right? It's constant. If we look for the y velocity, it starts at positive 12.86. Note, it doesn't start at positive 20. It starts at positive 12.86 and it ends at negative 12.86. And the slope of velocity versus time is acceleration. So the slope of this graph would be minus 9.8 meters per second squared. If we look at the y position versus time, it pretty much looks like its trajectory, right? And the reason that it looks exactly like y versus x is because the distance traveled in the x direction is also constant, right? But what we see is that this reaches a maximum height and then comes back down to Earth. By the way, we can actually come up with an equation for the range, right? So I don't really like showing this equation, but a lot of books make a lot of, um, make a big deal about this. And this is why I don't like to tell you about it. Um, I'm sorry, this isn't what I thought it was. This is. Um, an equation for the y as a function of x. Is that okay? So if you wanted to, you could solve the x equation for t and plug it into the y equation and we can come up with the y equation as a function of position, of x position. Okay? And we call this the trajectory. Once again, the x velocity is constant, so the distance it travels in the x direction is constant, and it's accelerating in the y direction at minus 9.8 meters per second square, or minus g. Okay, there's a little problem here, and, and that's, um, let's look at this problem we're going to take it and we're going to kick a baseball. I'm sorry, kick a baseball. We're going to kick a football and see if it go makes it over the crossbars. So the kicker is about 36 meters away and the crossbar is about 3.05 meters. And we want to find out if it makes it over the crossbar. Okay. So if you figure um, the crossbar is to a football, um, goalpost is about three three yards high, right? Okay, and that's what we see here. Okay, so we need to find out if it makes it over. So one thing is, and it also asks what the maximum height is. 
All right, if I want to find out if it makes it over the crossbar, I can't use the maximum height. Okay? So once again, if I want to find out if it makes it over the crossbar, I can't use the maximum height. How come? Because if I look at the maximum height, and we already figured out how to do that, right? We'll take um, our y velocity equation, right? And we remember that at the top of the trajectory, the velocity in the y direction is zero. And we'll come up with 15.97 meters per second squared divided by two times 9.8, and we come up with about 13 meters. Okay, and you might say, okay, so that's great. It makes up about 13 meters, and the crossbars are only three meters high. However, this can't tell us if it made it over the crossbars. So don't forget, in the last problem, we figured out how high it could go, and we just did it again, and it comes up to be about 13 meters. Here's the problem. It could reach its maximum height here, or it could reach its maximum height here, or it could reach its maximum height here. That doesn't tell us if it makes it over the crossbar. What we need to know is what the height is at the crossbar. So we need to figure out what the actual height is at the crossbar. So how can we do that, right? Oh, and by the way, um, we can look at where along the, the x-axis it reaches the maximum height, right? So how are we going to do that? Well, we can figure out the time it takes to get to the maximum height, right? So we know what the final y velocity is at the top. It's zero. We know what the initial y velocity is, okay? And we have this equation for finding the y velocity. So we can solve that for time. And we get our initial y velocity, which is about 16, minus 0 divided by 9.8. It comes out to be about 1.63 seconds. That's the time it takes it to get to the maximum height. We can plug that into the x equation and we get 12.6, I mean 12.04 meters per second times 1.63, we get about 19.63 meters. So it reaches the maximum height before it ever gets to the crossbar. And then it's on its way down, okay? So what we need to do is figure out what the height is at the crossbar. However, we know what the, what the x velocity is. The x velocity is 12.04 meters per second. And we know the distance to the crossbar. Okay? So here's the idea. Forget about this problem for a second. Let's say you need to go 180 miles and you're going to travel a constant velocity of 60 miles per hour, how long is it going to take you? So 180 miles, 60 miles per hour, you say three hours. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing, only the units are a little weird. We have to go 36 meters, and our velocity is 12.04, so we get almost three seconds. So it takes three seconds to get to the crossbars. Now we can figure out the height at the crossbar. So we get the y, we get y equals y initial plus the initial y velocity minus one half gt squared. So that's zero. And then our y velocity times three minus one half 9.8 times 3 squared, and we end up with y equals 3.94 meters. Okay, so if there's a barrier, you have to figure out 
how far, like what the time it is to get to the barrier, and then find the height at the barrier. It can't help you to find the maximum height if you want to find if it makes it over the barrier. In this case, it was a football and a crossbar, right? It could be a soccer net or it could be a tennis net or something like that. Now, we know that it's on its way down because we figured out where the maximum height is. However, there's another way to check and see if it's on its way up or down. Okay, so it definitely made it over. If we plug that time into our y velocity, if the y velocity comes out to be positive, that means it's still going up. And it comes to be negative, that means it's on its way down. Okay? So don't forget, if there's a barrier, you have to figure out the height at the barrier. And usually you can use the x velocity to figure out the time it takes to get there and then plug it into the y equation to see what the height is. So it makes it over. By the way, if you've ever played tennis, right? That's when usually I think about this, right? Depending on the angle you hit the ball at, right? Depends on how far it's going to go. So these are trajectories of a tennis ball that were hit with exactly the same velocity, but at different angles, okay? And you could see at different angles, it lands different distances away. And if the angle's really small, it lands a couple feet from you. And if the angle's really large, it goes up really high and it lands a couple feet from you. So what we find is that if you want the maximum range, then you'll put it at 45 degrees, okay? So let's look for the range. The range is the x velocity times the time of flight. And I can solve for the time of flight. Once again, this equation we're about to give you is called the range equation. And it only works if you start and stop at the same height, okay? So you can only use this equation if it starts and stops at the same height, okay? So we take the y equation, we start and stop at the same height, and we solve for the time. So we come up with the time is equal to two times the y velocity divided by g. But the y velocity is just the initial y velocity times the sine of theta. So we'll plug it into the equation. All right. So we'll plug in for the time of flight, 2 times the initial y velocity times the sine of theta. Then there's a trig function that says the sine of 2 theta is equal to twice the sine of theta, the cosine of theta. So this is twice the sine of theta, the cosine of theta. And our range equation is V naught squared times the sine of two theta times 90. And the sine of two theta equals one when the sine of two theta equals 90 degrees. So this will happen at 45. And this range equation once again, only works if it starts and stops at the same height. Okay, so this range equation only works if it starts and stops at the same height. And the only reason we're showing you is because it proves that if you want the maximum range, launch it at 45 degrees. Let's take another example, all right? Let's take something and fire it horizontally off a cliff. What that means 
is that it has no initial y velocity. So it's being fired horizontally off the cliff. And let's say an initial x velocity is 10 meters per second. So what's going to happen in this case? No matter where I am along this trajectory, the x component is 10 meters per second. And what's going to happen is the y component of the velocity will get larger and larger negative. And once again, we want to find them. This really should say x max. I want to find the distance from the bottom of the cliff to where it lands. Okay. And okay, so sometimes books will call this the range, and sometimes they weren't. But but the range should just be used, the word range should just be used if it starts and stops at the same height. Okay? All right. So we want to find the time of flight and we want to find the range. Okay? If we want to find the time of flight, we can use this e the same y equation again. And I'll tell you, probably about 95% of the time, if you want to find the time of flight, it'll involve this equation here, okay? So like I said, about 95% of the time, if they ask you time of flight, look at that equation first. Okay, so this time, the initial height, height does not equal the final height. And by the way, we usually start, whatever our initial y position is, we'll call it zero meters. That means that our final y position here will be negative 20 meters, okay? So I'm always going to start with my y position being zero and my x position being zero, okay? And in this case, my final y position will be negative 20. My initial y velocity is zero because I launched it horizontally, okay? So in this case, I get y naught minus y is equal to one half gt squared and I can solve for t. Okay, so I can solve for t and I end up with t is equal to the square root of two times the change in y divided by g. So it's the square root of zero minus a negative 20. So my initial position was zero, my final position is negative 20 divided by g, which is 9.8 meters per second squared, I end up with about 2.02 seconds. Okay, so how far from the cliff does it land? Okay, so think about for that for a minute. How far from the cliff does it land? So I know it was in the air for about 2.02 seconds. And I know the x velocity is constant, 10 meters per second. So I think it's going to land 20.2 meters away. Okay, so what we have is that I look for x equals x naught um, plus the velocity in the x direction times time. My initial x position is zero. So we get 10 meters per second times two, I get 20.2 meters. So it lands 20.2 meters from the cliff. All right, so um, if we look for um, the last possibility, right? So one possibility is it starts and it stops at the same height. The second possibility is it starts at a, a, off a cliff, but it's shot straight out. And now it starts from a cliff, and we launch it at an angle. We're still going to call this y equals 0 and x equals 0. Okay. And now if we want to figure out what this delta y is, or this y max, right? we can use this equation again. So once again, our initial, um, sorry, our initial y velocity in this case is 6.43, and our final y velocity at the top is zero.
So we end up with delta y being about 2.11 meters. Now let's find the time of flight. In this case, nothing cancels. So nothing here cancels, right? I mean, technically y naught is zero, but I'm saying we can't solve easily for t, right? We have to use the full-blown quadratic equation. So what we're gonna end up with is, we'll put in our values and we get zero minus a negative 20 meters plus 6.43 meters per second t minus one half 9.8 meters per second squared t squared. So I get 20 plus 6.43 meters per second t minus 4.9 meters per second t squared. And now I have to plug this into the quadratic equation, right? So in this case, A is negative 4.9, B is 6.43, and C is 20. And now we just have to plug it in. So we get minus B, minus 6.43, plus or minus B squared, 6.43 squared, minus 4, minus 4.9, which is A, times c, which is 20, all divided by 2 times negative 4.9, where a is negative 4.9. And we end up with 2.78 seconds and minus 1.47 seconds. So we said there'll be no negative time in this class. So we end up with 2.78 seconds. That's how long it was in the air. And now we just have to multiply this by the x velocity. That'll tell us how far it landed from the cliff. So we'll take Vx times the time of flight. We get about 21.29 meters from the cliff. We can also use this to find the final velocity. So our final x velocity is equal to our initial x velocity because there's no acceleration in the x direction. In the y direction, we get 6.43 meters per second minus 9.8 times the time it was in the air. We end up with minus 20.81 meters per second. If we write that in ij notation, it looks like this, right? The x component of the velocity times i and the y component of the velocity times j. If we take the square root of the sum of the squares, we can get the magnitude of the final velocity. And if we use the inverse tangent of the y component over the x component, we'll get the angle. Note this time, our final velocity doesn't equal our initial velocity, right? And what we're going to find out in a couple of chapters is what happened was potential energy became kinetic energy. Okay, so next time we'll show you this demonstration of what happens if you're a forest ranger and there's a sick monkey and you need to shoot it with a dart. And we want to know where you're going to let to shoot your gun at what angle. This is why. Because as soon as you shoot the gun, the monkey's going to get scared and it's going to let go. So if you want to hit the monkey with the dart so that you could put it to sleep and and take care of it, right? Then we need to know what angle to launch it at. Okay? And I'll show you a demonstration of that in class or in the Zoom lecture. All right. Thanks a lot.